Kane, um, Extension Poultry Specialist with the University of Wisconsin Extension. I'm going to talk today about raising a small flock of chickens, um, either urban or in a smaller uh, backyard setting. Um, a little bit of my background, I come from Nebraska originally, grew up on a small farm there, so we had pigs and cows and all sorts of different poultry um, and crops as well. Um, I have degrees from uh, University of Nebraska and from Iowa State University, um, and then I came here to Wisconsin and I've been here for Oh, 27 years or so. So um, I've had quite a bit of poultry experience over the years. Um, and I think hopefully I'll, I'll cover a lot of different aspects of getting started and raising a small flock of poultry today. We'll get started. So some of the things I'm going to cover, uh, kind of why you might want to raise chickens. Hopefully most of you have already thought about that and, and already come to that conclusion, but uh, I'll cover a few interesting things there. A little bit on some regulations, some production information. Um, I have, I think a little bit on integrating new birds to a flock. Um, some health and disease prevention. Um, a little bit on predator prevention and then a few other comments at the end. So um, we'll go there. So why might you want to raise chickens? And I know that's a turkey, uh, but I think it's, it's still fitting. Um, there are several reasons, I think. Probably for many people, this idea of having fresh eggs is where they get the idea and, and want to get started. Um, lots of different colors of eggs are available, as you see here, and you can have some different things. Um, kind of the idea of growing your own food um, certainly has been a popular uh, idea. I have there save money with a question mark. I would argue that you will not save money by raising your own chickens. Um, and so I don't, I hope no one goes into it feeling that. I think uh you know commercial egg producers because of their size and their scale um and they really can produce eggs cheaper than you're going to produce them at home and realizing that um you know i think most people don't go into this to save money so if you're thinking you're going to save money probably there are other ways to do better but um, still it, it's a way to produce eggs Meat is another option, depending on your situation. If you're down, you probably can't do this, um, or at least not very easily. But uh, if you're in a, a more rural situation, you might raise birds for meat. I think this idea of garbage disposal, using plant uh, vegetable scraps and things like that is certainly a good method. Um, and they will eat some bugs, um, certainly, you know, if you can allow them to range, they'll eat bugs out of your lawn and things. I probably wouldn't suggest having them in the garden like this shows. They'll tear up a lot of things. They uh, will dust bathe and dig things out. They'll probably eat some of your plants as well. So um, probably not the best situation, but they can use up a lot of the scraps and things. A fertilizer source. I don't think too many people get them for this purpose, but they certainly are a good source. Um, I put this logo up here. I think they are not in business right now, but this was a local company that was selling chicken manure as a fertilizer source. And there are some others. You can buy them at your farm stores and things. Um, but certainly your own chickens will produce a, a nice fertilizer. And I'll go over this fairly quickly, but I think there's been some good research that chicken manure and litter, along with its value as a fertilizer, also helps the soil as sort of a um, soil conditioner. Um, I do need to mention food safety, and I'll mention this again later on with more of a human safety. Um, 
but there is a risk of salmonella and possibly other bacteria in the chicken manure. Um, so if you're using it on vegetable plants, especially, um, composting is probably best. Um, the CDC recommends that you would have it 90 days, you would apply it to your soil 90 days prior to harvest um, or 120 days prior if it's root crops radishes, carrots, things like that. Um, a lot of times I would suggest putting it on in the fall, tilling it in, and then by next spring it should have been uh, broken down and any bacteria that are in there should have been destroyed. So, um, but it is a very good garden um, condition. Another reason to raise chickens, I think not only for children, but adults as well, Chickens are really interesting, and, and this is probably what got me into it, is some of the genetics involved, and I won't go into those today, but, but there are some really interesting things you can do with, with single genes um, in chickens. Um, embryology is really neat, getting to raise animals, a lot of these things, you know, again, knowing where your food is coming from and the idea that you can go out and gather eggs, all these things are really interesting. And for many people, they really become a pet. Um, and I say not your ordinary cat or dog, but chickens really can become pets. There's lots of colors and patterns, and I'll show you some of those coming up. Behaviors are interesting. Um, and you can get into chickens pretty inexpensively, okay? We'll talk about some of those things, but, but it is a neat thing that you can get into and raise animals. So, Hopefully, if you weren't convinced already, you're convinced that there are some really good reasons to, to raise chickens. So the next thing really is to make sure that it's legal where you live. Um, different towns and, and cities have different rules. Um, even different townships and, and some rural areas have some rules about this. So you do wanna check and make sure what's legal. Um, I would say more and more places are allowing them, so I think it's becoming more common. Um, there are a couple of other things to consider as far as legal regulations. In the state of Wisconsin, anyone who raises chickens, whether it's one chicken or a million chickens, um, and this is true with other animals as well, livestock species, you are supposed to get a premise ID, okay? And it's free, it's online, you can register for this. So the idea of a premise ID is that um, if there's a disease outbreak, the Department of Agriculture can easily find uh, where those animals are across the state. And so um, they will go and test the birds that are in within so many miles of an outbreak. Um, if you haven't registered, then they won't know that you're there, which you might think is good, but you could be a part of the problem in that case. Um, and so I, I do encourage it. I would suggest you get this. It's very easy, very uh, simple. The Wisconsin Tested Flock or NPIP status most of you probably won't need this. Um, this involves some blood testing. Um, NPIP involves some fees and some inspection. Um, this would be mostly if you are going to sell uh, fertile eggs or, or chicks from your flock, um, or if you're going to exhibit them um, in some situations. So. Again, I could answer more questions on that, but I think most people will not need to do this with just a small flock. So you've covered the legal regulations. Next thing I think is to consider where you're gonna keep these chickens. Um, so we'll look a little bit at housing. And I will say that there's almost as many different types of chicken housing as there are flocks of chickens. Um, there's a lot of variation, a lot of things can work. 
And so it will depend on your situation, what you want. Um, but I'll cover a few things that I think you should consider. Um, and, and so we'll go to there. So why do we need housing? Well, most people would say to keep the chickens in, and that's true, but I would argue that it's probably more important um, to keep other things out, okay? And we're gonna talk more about predators, but this tends to be one of the biggest challenges that most people will, will struggle with. Um, and so housing is to mostly a great deal to keep predators out. It will also be to keep diseases out, and some protection from the elements. So we have to think about winter here and that can be quite a challenge. So some things I would suggest you consider um, with housing. I like insulation for a chicken coop um, or chicken house. Um, there are different opinions on this, but I think insulation is good. I think it helps both in the winter and the summer. Um, and so I would suggest insulating your coop. Now, I will definitely caution you, and I found this picture, and I think it is such a classic picture. If you use styrofoam insulation, you have to cover it. For some reason, chickens love styrofoam and they will eat it until it's gone. I don't know why it doesn't do anything for them. And it passes right through their system, but they will definitely destroy it. So if you're going to use styrofoam insulation, you want to cover it with something so the chickens can't get to it. Okay? Um, ventilation is certainly important and we're going to look a little more at that. I would suggest you think about operator ease, especially for cleaning. If it's hard to clean, you're probably not going to clean. And so I would suggest that. Um, I was probably guilty of this as a kid when we were building hoops and things that I didn't think about those very much. Um, and really aesthetics, you'd like it to look nice, especially if you're in an urban environment where people might be walking by and seeing it. But even in a rural environment, it, it should look nice. Um, the flooring, most people will probably use wood. Um, it is quite expensive. It's nice if you have that, um, but it's, it's, most people will use wood. Um, some will put coverings over wood. I've heard of people, you know, to make it easier to clean. Um, you know, covering with linoleum or something like that. Um, and, and so those are some options. And then generally we would use a, a bedding or a litter on top of that. Shavings are probably the most common. Um, we use wood shavings at our poultry lab. It, it works very well. Um, corn cobs, if you can find them, can work very well. Um, some people use sand and really like it. It's easy to clean. It drains well. Um, I would kind of caution against straw. It's not usually the best, although some people like it. The chickens will like it, um, but it's, it's not really as absorbent and it tends to mat up and, and become kind of a pain. But some people use it and swear by it. Um, other parts of the world, there are others, but these are some common ones here. So back to ventilation. Um, this coop, if you can see, has been covered with plastic. Seems like a great idea in the winter. You want to seal everything in. It's not a very good idea, and I would not suggest it. If you can have an, an open door, then OK, it's not so bad. But you do need ventilation. And even in the winter, when it's miserable cold, you need some fresh air. Um, and really a big key is, is this idea of getting rid of water vapor. Chickens give off a lot of moisture. Their droppings are wet. Um, they breathe out a fair amount of, of moisture. And so it will get damp if you don't remove that. And dampness is not a good thing when you're raising chickens. Really, it's better to be dry than damp. Um, Couple other things um, with ventilation and, and winter care. Um, 
It's good to locate the windows outside of prevailing winds. Again, I would encourage you to have some at least small window open to let some fresh air in. Um, you're probably going to need to provide some heat, okay? Depending on the size of your flock, um, if you have quite a few chickens, then they will produce enough heat maybe to, to um, heat themselves. But if you have, you know, four chickens in a, an urban setting, I would suggest providing some heat. Not everyone agrees with me, and the chickens maybe can survive it, but not sure that we really want to just have them survive. I think we would be better off to have some, some heat. Now, having said that, be very careful, okay? We don't want to burn the coop down. And I've heard of this. This is a big one, but I've heard of people's small coops burning down as well. Um, it is important to have water for the birds, and this can be a challenge in the winter. At the very least, I would suggest having some mechanism to keep the water thawed. So there are some, some water heaters that you can use. Um, if you can't, you can provide water twice a day for them, fresh water, and, and they'll make it on that. Okay. Uh, again, probably want to have some, some supplemental heat. and. Here are two pictures that we want to avoid. Both of these are frostbite. Um, this rooster on the left, it's not terrible, but these black spots have, he has some frostbite there, okay, and the tips here. This one is quite bad, okay. All this discolored area on this comb is frozen and really is dead and will slough off eventually. So if you were to see this rooster by next year, um, he would have just sort of a flat comb and short comb there where all that had fallen off. Um, we really want to avoid that, okay? And so, again, I, I suggest some heat, okay? Doesn't have to be balmy warm, but if you can take some of that edge off. I would also say that um, ventilation is important. So if it's damp, you don't want that'll make it even worse. And I have your breed selection, and this is something to consider, or you might think about, um, is getting birds that have smaller combs, okay? So here's an example. This breed on the top uh, is called the Chanticleer. These are adult birds, but you can see very small combs and wattles, okay, as compared a leghorn like this with these big combs and waddles, the Hamburg. If you know that you're going to have a cold weather situation, you might want to think about birds with smaller uh, combs and waddles. Some examples of, of nice housing, um, and I'll talk about this later in predator prevention, but one thing is to keep stuff from digging in, and you see here that they have a wire and rock around it. We'll talk more about that later. Here they have rocks piled to keep predators out. Okay. All right, so some more examples. These are more what I would call summer housing options. They're probably not going to be very effective for winter, um, but they certainly can be used a lot. Most of these can be moved around so you can move them to to fresh uh, green areas. And so there's a lot of different options there. Um, again, these are more larger scale mobile coops. This is more of a permanent setting. And, and so you might want to think about something like this. One thing you'll say is that I will pretty well guarantee you if you have a permanent yard like this, there won't be anything green in it, okay? Um, between the chickens eating it and their droppings, um, it will be void of any green like this. But it can be pretty safe, um, a nice permanent setting. Along with the housing, I'll just mention, um, people usually ask how much space do they need for the birds? These are the minimum requirements, I would say. 
um, three to four square feet for layers. And I would say with dual purpose breeds, some of them will be a little heavier. Um, four to six square feet is a good plan. And I would suggest this be their indoor space, okay? Especially here in Wisconsin where we have winter and it gets pretty, pretty long and cold. They're going to be spending a lot of time indoors during that time, okay? And so I would suggest using this. And then if you can have more space outside, um, you know, I've seen estimates of 10 square feet outside for them is a good option. If you have that space, that'll be good. There are people who keep indoor chickens. <laughs> I would not suggest it, but yes, this is a chicken with a diaper on. Um, I think it's not a very good situation. It's, they do produce a lot of dust. Um, from their feather dander and from their feed and things. Um, so I, I don't think it's the best, but there are people who do this. So that gives you a little bit on housing. Again, there are lots and lots and lots of different options for housing. Your library probably has books on, on different house designs and things like that. We have some on our um, extension website so there are different options next what kind of chickens do you want and i mentioned that you know the climate might have an effect um, so some birds are better in cold weather than others um, i'll talk a little bit about purpose there are a few situations where you might really want a specific breed but i would say generally the personal preference is probably best look through different breed catalogs and things and if you want a chicken that looks like this um, then that's what you should get and you may have to adjust your housing to it but um, that's an option this is actually one called a showgirl if anybody really loves that one not my favorite but um, they're out there so here are some that you might get for a specific purpose. So if you really are wanting to get into the egg business, for example, okay, um, the white leghorn is probably number one for egg production, okay? Not everybody's favorite. They tend to be a little bit flightier, um, but very good egg production for white eggs. Likewise, the bird down here on the bottom left, um, usually it's called a sex link um, because you can can sort them by color as chicks these are probably the top brown egg layers okay they're hybrids they're commercially available but a lot of you sell them as well very good egg layers the easter eggers americanas things like that if you want blue and green eggs these are pretty common um, and then really, if you're in for meat, the Cornish cross is pretty tough to beat for meat production. Um, again, a lot of people don't really like raising them. You, you don't want to keep them very long, typically. Um, they're, they're kind of meant to be used for meat and not much else. But beyond that, there are so many different what I'll call yard ornaments, okay? And I don't mean that negatively. Um, so many different breeds and varieties. So we have different colors, okay? We have buff and black and blue and white. And there's red. Um, patterns, lacing and spangling and penciling and all sorts of different patterns, okay? And I should mention, I don't have size on here. But this bird on the top left um, probably stands, you know, a foot and a half to two feet tall. Um, big, big bird. This guy over here on the right is maybe 10 inches tall um, at most, weighs maybe a pound and a half, okay? Um, so a lot of different variation in breeds as well. And sizes. Shapes. We have 
long, thin, modern games here. We've got fluffy cochins. We've got Cornish with the large breast. Um, so lots of different ones you can use. We have some even more exotic. We have the Polish with their top knots. We have the silkies. Okay, so lots of different varieties. So again, I think for most people, it's a personal preference. If that's what you want to raise, then, then that's what you should get. This I'm not going to spend much time on, but I'll just mention a couple points. This is kind of, you can either start with hatching eggs, you can start with baby chicks, or you can start with adult birds. Personally, I would suggest baby chicks for most people is the way to go, okay? For hatching eggs, you need incubator or broody hens, and you need some incubation skills, and I think the, the odds of success are less. Um, with adults, you tend to have some risk of bringing in some diseases um, that we'll talk about later. And so I think for most people, chicks are the best. Okay. With that, I'm going to talk about some sort of general husbandry. And this is a term that you'll, you'll see a fair amount in uh, husbandry of most animals. And I don't mean that I'm picking at people's flaws, certainly, but this stands for feed, light, air, water, and I usually say space, although some people say sanitation. So either one there. So I'll talk about a little bit on each of these. Um, and I'll start out with brooding chicks. So here are a couple options you might do with brooding. Um, you know, if you just have half a dozen chicks or so, something like this can be nice. Um, it's got, you know, feeding water and light and air quality. Um, if you're getting more chicks, you might use something more permanent like this. Again, there are lots of different options. I've seen people raise them in wading pools. I've seen them in stock tanks, all sorts of different things. Not one I would suggest, okay? But uh, certainly there are people who try this. These are a little bit bigger systems. Again, if you're going with a bigger flock, um, but probably for most of you, you won't have that many chickens. Another option, if you have a broody hen, you can let her take care of this and that'll work quite well. So back to our flaws. Um, feed for chicks, I would say most people will buy a commercial chick starter. Um, that's what I would suggest. I don't think you want to start trying to create your own. Um, usually these will be about 18% protein um, and balanced quite well for the chicks. And that's what I would suggest. If you're raising those Cornish rock broilers, um, you want more protein, but generally for other chicks, 18 is good. Medicated or not is always a question that comes up, and, and I'm really pretty ambivalent about this. Um, the medicated chick feed is really for one disease, and that is coccidiosis, and I'll mention it a little bit later. Uh, and coccidiosis can be somewhat prevented um, if you keep the litter dry if you keep everything dry it usually can be uh, prevented and so you can get by without medication there's also a treatment if you do you know end up with coccidiosis um, the medicated feed sort of gives you a little extra buffer is the way I look at it, okay? So if you want to use it, it'll help. It'll give you a little more, more buffer there, um, but people get by without it, without a problem. So kind of a personal choice. Um, as the chickens get older, we'll lower their protein and raise their calcium as they get to breeding age, but I'll mention that later. 
A question also often comes up about grit. So grit is really just gravel or rocks um, and the chickens will eat this and as as you probably know chickens don't have teeth and so they swallow rocks these go to the gizzard and they help grind feed if you're feeding a crumbled diet or ground diet like this um, you really don't need grit everything has already been ground up for them okay if you're feeding whole grains um, or when you get a little bit older chickens and you start feeding them um, vegetable scraps and things like that then you probably want to provide grit okay if they're outside they're going to eat their own sand and things and pick up rocks where they can find them and so you may not need to but grit is pretty cheap pretty easy to provide and so again you may want to provide that so that usually brings up another question what table scraps can i feed and i would say generally most anything that uh you can eat the chickens can eat okay there may be some exceptions but they're pretty rare um and so generally you can go by that don't feed spoiled stuff i think that's obvious but um you know if it's if it's noticeably spoiled i wouldn't feed it there are a few situations where things might flavor the eggs i think you'd have to feed quite a bit but for example the old thing is that if they're eating a lot of onions you might get some onion flavor in the eggs um, if they get an occasional scrap of onion that's not going to do it but but you might um, there are a few things flaxseed and things that can sometimes cause a fishy taste in the eggs so but again those are pretty rare now two things about this again you probably need to provide grit if you're going to provide vegetable scraps the other thing is don't count on this really saving you feed okay um most of these vegetable trimmings and things are, are pretty low in in energy and protein um and so they're probably not going to provide a lot of nutrition for the bird some vitamins and things, and, and there's certainly nothing wrong with them, but you're probably still going to have to feed as much feed. So, so I wouldn't count on you know replacing feed with them. Lights, natural light works very well for chicks. Um, you know, you can you can have a light on otherwise if you need it for heat, but otherwise natural light will work very well doesn't need to be bright. In fact, excessively bright light can sometimes make them pick a little more, although usually that's when older birds. Um, and light will become important later. Air, we can think about temperature. And this is an old, old adage, but it still holds true. Um, start them at about 95 degrees Fahrenheit and decrease that about five degrees per week okay so in the spring if you're starting chicks generally by about you know six weeks or so they're out there to where they only need 60 degree temperatures and you can start taking the heat away depending on the environment um, one thing i would suggest is using a temperature gradient and by that i mean have the heat over to one side of their area so that they can move closer or farther away and they will they'll if they're cold they'll move closer to the heat if they're warm they'll move farther away um, pretty simple but it works quite well the other thing i would say about this is listen to the chicks they will tell you if they're uncomfortable okay um, you can tell if they're a comfortable cheap versus uh, a stress cheat okay it'll be loud it'll be it'll sound like they're stressed and so i would watch that um, but generally again if you provide this gradient they'll move right here to it 
The other part of air is really the air quality. Um, and again, I mentioned earlier, we want good ventilation, even for chicks, we need fresh air. And there's a whole list of things here and I won't go through all of them, but if you get wet litter, you can have a lot of problems. Ammonia will probably be the first thing you'll notice. It will smell. Um, again, we can see more coccidiosis problems, maybe flies, some other problems, okay? Water, there's not a lot to say about it. Try to have clean water and a constant supply, okay? Very important though that they have water. So, kind of quick, but that's some things on uh, sort of general husbandry of the chicks. Typically then, about four to six months of age, they will reach maturity and now we'll have some other things, okay? And I'll mention the season of the year. Um, I'll touch on that in just a, a minute or two, okay? Um, at this time, we'll start to see some new behaviors. The males will start crowing, and if you're living in a, an urban environment, that may be a challenge, okay? Most cities do not allow roosters, and so you'll probably have to figure out something to do with them at that point. Um, and that's something you might want to think about ahead of time, is what will you do if you do get a rooster? Um, because it's not terribly uncommon to, to get a rooster, even if you purchase sex chicks. Um, pecking orders can occur, and we've all heard about pecking orders in chickens, and I, I have this picture of these birds, I think is kind of a classic, but uh, the chickens all want to be the top, okay, at the top of that pecking order. And so you will run into this some where they may start to fight a little bit. Generally, if they've been raised together, it's pretty minimal. If you start mixing chickens, you can run into some problems. If you have roosters and hens, you'll probably see some mating. Um, and then hopefully, most of us are looking for eggs, and so they should start laying eggs in at that point. Some feeding changes. The big, big change here is that we want to start providing more calcium. They need high levels of calcium um, to produce eggshells. And so we want to switch to a layer diet when they start laying eggs. Okay. You'll see most of these will have probably three to 4% calcium um, in the diet. Now back to the season. So chickens are typically what we call long day breeders, okay? And what this means is they will lay when the days are getting longer. Um, so when the, in the spring is typically when we think about this, when the days are getting longer, that will stimulate the birds to start reproducing. And in the wild, of course, that coincides with spring, so that they would produce chicks to be there. Um, I say it's not always the case. If you raise pullets, so young females, um, that first year, they'll probably lay no matter what the lights are, okay? May take them a little bit longer, might take them, you know, six months instead of four or five, but they'll start laying. Older hens, though, you'll see this a lot, and generally they'll lay in the spring and into the summer, and then as the days start shortening in the fall, they'll stop laying, okay? So to get around that, an option is to use artificial light, and some people do this, some people don't. It's certainly an, an option, personal opinion, um, but if you want better egg production in the winter, you can keep the hens on about 14 hours of light per day. So you can get a nice little timer like this and have your lights on so that they stay on for about 14 hours. Um, and that will help keep the hens laying over the winter. If you don't wanna do that, that's perfectly acceptable too. Um, they'll start laying again in the spring usually when the uh, days get longer. 
And you'll still get some eggs over the winter, but it'll be better if it does. So, some challenges you may run into. I would say predators tend to be one of the biggest problems most people have with small flocks. And I have this good looking fella here. Um, dogs can be a very good thing. They can prevent predators. Um, they also can be a predator themselves. And I, I do hear a lot about this especially in urban environments where dogs um, get in and, and attack the chickens. So it's something to consider. Um, if you have a dog, you want to make sure that, you know, he's trained and, and doesn't attack the chickens. Neighbors' dogs, hopefully you have good fencing. So some suggestions. Uh, build like it's Fort Knox, okay? Um, you really need to build to keep predators out is the best thing, okay? I'll show you this burying the fence. Um, this is what I mean by that. If you can take some wire and fold it out, and this only needs to be oh, a foot or two, okay? Um, most predators, if they're going to try to dig in under your fence or coop, will come up here and try to dig and they'll hit that fence. I don't know of any of them that are smart enough to back up two feet and try to dig under, okay? Maybe you'll find one, but generally they won't. Some other things, um, electric fence, I'll show you an option there. Netting over the top, this can help with hawks and things, but it also can help keep raccoons out. Um, Again, dogs can be good. If you have a dog that will be around and keep stuff away, that's very good. Depending on your location and your thoughts on this, there are traps. Certainly guns are an option, um, different things there. Again, here's a good solid rock bottom. This is a good solid coop, okay? Here's that wire again that I showed you where, again, stuff can't really dig in because you've got that wire around the outside. Here's a, a good setup with electric fence. This will, will work well to keep raccoons and things from climbing up, okay? Might seem like overkill, but if you're in a situation where you need it, that can be good. This is some of that netting. Um, I don't know if it's wonderful, but it can work pretty well and it can keep the chickens in. It's pretty mobile, so you can move it around. Some other things to think about, and this was really, I think, um, you know, one that we should all consider. This is more to keep diseases out um, in most situations. So biosecurity is something that you'll hear from every every poultry person, I think, in the nation. Um, this is stopping disease spread. And I would say that people tend to be the most common carriers of most diseases. If you think about it, your chickens are in their coop and pen, hopefully. Um, there's probably a higher likelihood that you're going to track something into them than other things. Things. That being said, other animals can certainly as well. So this little mouse can be quite a disease carrier. Other birds can be a challenge. So we'll talk about some of those briefly. So what can we do to stop people from bringing in disease? Well, limit contact with other birds and their equipment and things. Now, if you're a big fan of chickens, it's natural to want to go see other people's chickens, right? So that you know, take with a grain of salt. Um, but it is something to, to try to do. Um, if you have contact with others, clean and disinfect. If you borrow somebody's crate to move chickens or something, clean it and disinfect it. Um, wash your hands before and after handling the chickens, okay? Pretty simple, but that can help stop spreading disease. 
Something that I would suggest is having dedicated footwear to wear in your chicken coop. A pair of slip-on boots is easy to have. Just leave them right there at the door of the coop and slip out of your other shoes and into those and you go in. And then it, those stay in that coop all the time. Um, likewise, some plastic boots for visitors, okay? If you come to our lab, we have some little booties that you slip over your shoes so that you don't track something in on the bottom of your shoes. Pretty simple, but they can help. And then other animals, and I'll talk about those. This is not what you want to use have this coming into your, your chicken coop, right? You definitely want to clean and disinfect that before you bring it. Um, I mentioned earlier in the talk about adult birds and how you could run some health risks. This is one that I think is, is a pretty common way that people get disease in their flock. And I hear this a lot from a lot of different questions. I bought a new chicken. I got some chickens that my neighbor wanted to get rid of, things like that. And now all my chickens are sick. And it is certainly a concern. There's especially one disease called chronic respiratory disease that a bird can look perfectly healthy and they can be carrying this. And then they spread it into all of your birds, okay? Um, and so you do want to be very careful of that and, and kind of, you know, again, especially if you're just getting started, I would not suggest starting with adult birds. I would suggest starting with chicks. And then maybe as you learn and can go on, you, you can move into other things. There is a bit of human health concern too. And I want to mention this. This has been in the news a lot lately. And it's definitely a concern. Um, chickens can carry salmonella, okay? And, you know, I hear people saying, oh, that's just the commercial guys. It's, it's bad situation that they have. And that's absolutely false, okay? Chickens can carry salmonella no matter what situation they're in. Um, it doesn't, most of the salmonellas don't bother them or at least a lot of the types of salmonella don't. And so they can be perfectly healthy and be carrying this. And again, there's been, I just saw a news article out that there's close to 500 cases that have been traced to backyard poultry just this year. Um, I think one person has died from it actually. So, so it is something to consider and it's a serious concern. Um, you know, again, wash your hands especially after handling the birds, don't eat and drink around them. And I think especially monitor children. I mentioned earlier, chickens can be great with children and, and having them learn about responsibility and things, but you also need to watch, okay? Wash their hands, don't have them sucking their thumb and things when they're around chickens. Um, just some things there to consider. So those are some human health concerns and, and humans carrying diseases. A couple things on rodents, and I'll go fairly quickly here, but, but you might think this little mouse isn't really a big concern, okay? The problem tends to be what he leaves behind, okay, in these droppings. Those droppings are often loaded with bacteria, um, certainly salmonella, but could be others. And if he's sitting in the feeder eating, he's probably leaving just as many of those. And then the chicken comes along and eats it. And now you've got the chicken infected. Um, so rodents can certainly be a, a disease spread. And some things to do, again, physical barriers. If you have a good solid coop where they can't get in, that's probably the biggest thing. Keep the outside environment down where it's not very hospitable for them. Don't have feed for them. If you can hang the feeder so that they can't get into it, that's usually a pretty simple thing to do and it helps. Um, if it gets really bad, take the feed away at night and put it in something where they can't get to it. Okay? Don't give them areas to nest. Don't have boards piled up or things like that that they can get in. 
And again, there are lots of different baits and traps and things to use, but really prevention is a key. Other birds definitely can spread parasites, okay? Mites are a big thing I'll mention here in a few minutes, um, but these birds can spread them. Again, prevention is key. If you can fence out your coop, the windows can have screen over them um, to keep birds out. Really, just like the rodents, eliminating feed and eliminating nesting areas. If you can put the feed inside where the sparrows and stuff can't get to it, um, or, or it's difficult for them, that's good. Don't give them nesting areas. If there's an area where the sparrows are nesting, try to cover it with wire so that they can. Okay. Couple diseases, and I'm not going to spend much time here, but I'll just mention a couple, and I've already kind of hinted at them, but these are some that you might see. This buff looking bird here um, has coccidiosis. Coccidiosis, as I mentioned, um, spreads, in, maybe I didn't mention, spreads in the litter and causes diarrhea in the birds, okay? It damages the intestines, so you get diarrhea, sometimes bloody diarrhea. Um, the birds don't want to eat. They act like they're really cold and they huddle up and, and shiver. And it's pretty common in, in, I'll say, sort of teenage birds, young birds, um, a couple of months old. Okay? There is treatment for that one. So you can treat it if they show signs of this. Merrick's disease is another uh, disease that's not unusual in that age of birds especially. So sort of six weeks to six months is the most common time. This one is viral. There's no treatment for it. This bird is showing Merrick's disease and it causes paralysis of the nerves. And so the chicken often will lay and sort of paddle because they, their legs can't function. Um, if your bird gets this, it's probably going to die from it, okay? Um, so you want to prevent that one and you can vaccinate for this in day old chicks. Okay? If you're buying chicks from a hatchery, I would suggest you pay the extra 20 cents or whatever and get the Merrick's vaccination. Um, I mentioned chronic respiratory disease. Again, this is one that can, can be a problem. It's really hard to get rid of once you have it in your flock. Parasites, lice and mites are not unusual. Again, especially if you have wild birds coming in, they'll spread them. Um, there are treatments available. There are some dust baths and things that you can use to try to prevent these. Um, and again, there are some, some pretty good treatments available if you actually have a, a break. Scaly leg mites. Again, a little mite gets up under the scales of the bird and, and can be a challenge. These you usually can, can treat pretty easily with uh, petroleum jelly. And worms. This is a bad case of worms, but it's not unusual for worm, for chickens that are out on range to have some worms. Um, many of them will sort of live with it. And you may never know that they have them. Um, there are There is one treatment now that's available for uh, deworming and laying hens. So um, there are some things you can do there. I don't know if it's a problem so much as, as a something to think about. Um, chickens will live for quite a while, okay? Some 10 to 12 years, some will live longer than that probably. Um, the issue comes up that they really lay eggs the best the first couple of years, okay? And Every year that egg production gets poorer and poorer. I've heard estimates say 20% less each year. So if you get out to five years or so, you're down to where they're only laying a few eggs in the spring, okay? And that's fine. The question becomes sort of why you have them. Are they pets? 
um, or are they egg producers? And that will determine then what you want to do with them. Okay. And so many people by this point say, they're my pets. I like having them. You can still keep them for the pest bug uh, eating and things like that. Um, just don't expect a lot of eggs. Others will use them for stewing hens or something like that, um, or pass them on to someone else who's going to use them and get new ones. So, so it is something to consider and, and sort of think about where you'll go with that in the future. So I hate to end on lots of, of nasty, horrible things like scaly leg mite and things like that. Um, Generally, I would say that you don't have a lot of problem with these. If you build a good coop and you have good feed and water and, and things for them, things go pretty well. Okay, so um, I've kind of mentioned some of the things you might run into, but don't feel like everyone runs into those problems. So, um, I guess we don't really have a question for Matt. Um, so. I would end it with that um, and go from there.